Welcome to Main Voices Livestream. Before we begin, some messages from our sponsors. Stroudwater Lodge is an independent and assisted living community located just minutes from downtown Portland. Residents love the spirit of the lodge, enjoying the privacy of their own apartment and all the benefits of a full service community with easy access to fabulous dining, entertainment, and shopping. Stroudwater Lodge is just a stone's throw from their sister community, Avita of Stroudwater, which focuses on memory care. When you're out in the wild, or you're in the water, or you're looking at an island that was formed hundreds of thousands of years ago, you realize that we're only here for a flash of time. And you also learn, the older you get, if you're lucky enough to get old, is that it starts to accelerate really fast. We've had the privilege of working with some families for over five generations. So we know when someone is trying to make a decision about who to trust their legacy with, that it's one of the biggest decisions that they'll ever confront. We are disciplined investors and strategic family trust planners. We've managed wealth for generations and we are grateful for the trust families have given us. This is patience. This is discipline. This is trust. This is H.M. Payson. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa DeSisto. I'm the publisher of the Portland Press Herald, and a warm welcome tonight to our subscribers. Thank you for being here. I hope that we found you healthy, that you've had a delicious dinner, because I know you're going to get hungry. And I hope you've been vaccinated or have a vaccination appointment in your future. We are so appreciative of the continued support from our sponsors, H.M. Payson, Stroudwater Lodge, and Hub Furniture. And tonight, for the first time ever, we are providing sign language interpretation. MJ Grant is our ASL interpreter. She's an instructor and mentor at USM's interpreter training program. We are pleased to make this investment in accessibility at our events. If you don't want to watch the sign language interpretation, you can easily switch your viewing preferences to speaker view, and you'll find that selection in the top right hand corner of your zoom window. And let's face it, by now, aren't we all zoom experts? Well, we love food in Maine, don't we? And the Press Herald is committed to covering Maine's vibrant food scene. It's rare for a newspaper in a city our size to have a standalone food section and dedicated food journalists. But lucky us, we have both. And one of the most popular weekly features in the Maine Sunday Telegram is the restaurant review from our restaurant critic, Andrew Ross, who is our host tonight. His role requires him to be anonymous when he visits restaurants. So you'll be seeing a digital version of him tonight on camera. It's very funky. <laughs> Prior to coming to Maine, Andrew wrote about food and wine in New York and the United Kingdom. Well, many of you have been waiting a long time for tonight. This event was originally scheduled as an in-person event for last March, but we are delighted to bring it to you tonight. And Sam Sifton is with us from New York City. He's an assistant managing editor of the New York Times and founder of the wildly popular NYT cooking app. I know I would be lost without those sheet pan meal recipes. <laughs> now you don't make it to the Maine Voices Live stage without having a deep connection to Maine. And Sam has spent time in Maine every year of his life. And I hope we get to hear more about that as well as take many, many of your questions. So please welcome to our virtual stage, Andrew Ross and Sam Sifton. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you. So I am going to reiterate what Lisa said. I, I would love to be face to face, real face to face with you. Uh, but my role requires that I be anonymous or as anonymous as is possible in a tiny state like ours. So I get to come to you through the magic of, of uh, a computer program called FaceRig. And I hope that it is not too disturbing to anyone. That is also not even my real apartment behind me. That's someone else's apartment. But Sam, let's get started by talking about Maine a little bit. So as Lisa said, you spent 
part of at least every year of your life here. So tell tell us a little bit about your personal connection and your personal history with Maine. Sure, I'd love to, Andrew. But let's acknowledge right off the bat that it is deeply unsettling um, <laughs> talking uh, to an avatar like this. I feel a little bit like I'm in a video game. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd hope you don't pull out a weapon at some point. It seems entirely possible. Um, so yes, I have spent part of... Um, each year of my life in the state of Maine. And I've been lucky to do that because my grandparents lived on, on Bailey Island. Um, my uh, parents brought us um, to, to see them um, every year. Uh, that continued after their deaths. Um, and it continues today. I have a brother and sister-in-law who, who live in Brunswick and I have a child at College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor. Um, and as it happens, this is the odd stuff about COVID times. I was in the state of Maine just yesterday, dropping off a socially distanced care package and skedaddling right back to, to New York uh, afterward with my kid at COA. So it's, a, it's, just a, a, it's just a marvelous place to be. I feel more myself and more at home um, when I'm in the state. Uh, and so I'm overjoyed to be with you tonight. I wish it was in person as it was meant to be last year and hopefully uh, will be in some future date. Absolutely. So it sounds like you've got a lot of childhood memories of Maine as well as adult memories. So tell us a little bit about some of your strongest food associations with Maine from your childhood. Oh, from my childhood. Well, it, you know, that it gets very blueberries for Sal very quickly. <laughs> Um, I spent, uh, my mother was a passionate berry picker, and I spent um, a lot of time in high bush blueberry uh, patches with, with her, in the blackberry brambles, um, uh, the wild um, strawberries of, of the early part of the season, um, raspberries for, for days. And I like to think that I helped her in some of her canning efforts. I'm sure I did not help. Um, but I certainly enjoyed the, the, the literal fruits of, of that labor. Um, my childhood food memories in, in the state are absolutely berry centric, um, that, which is not to say that they don't also include lots of clams and, and, and lots of fish as well. Um, but it, it really, if you ask me to, to, to locate a, my childhood main memories around food, it's all about berries. Well, that seems pretty reasonable. <laughs> so speaking of berries though, you know, when, when people think about Maine food, especially people who either haven't been here or who haven't been here in a very long time, they really only generally have a couple of associations. There's lobster and in specific lobster rolls, uh, blueberries usually, uh, sometimes whoopie pies, but then again, that's contested territory. A bunch yeah. of states claim those. So when you talk about food from Maine with people who haven't really been here or haven't been here in a long time, how do you describe it? What do you say about it? Well, it's completely different now, right? I mean, yes, there are still people who cling to the belief that lobster is Maine's food and you have a lobster roll and a slice of blueberry pie and that's it. But if you look at what happened to the state's food uh, culture, in the years since I was a kid, it's just astonishing. The amount of quality ingredients that are coming out of farms in the state of Maine, that are um, coming out of bakeries, that are coming out of restaurants, it's just, it's, it's, it's literally invigorating to, to experience. I said um, that I zipped into the state and zipped out of the state to drop off this care package uh, for my kid. I also stopped at my brother's house and I had um, a bite to eat with him. And it was bread from Zoo's Bakery in Portland, um, well, from the farmer's market in, in, in Brunswick. Um, it was, you know, some local eggs from Bodenham. And it was, lob and it was uh, venison sausage from a deer harvested right in the town of Harpswell. And I thought to myself as I ate this, these three things, all from a kind of 20 mile radius, that, wow, there's something that you couldn't find anywhere else in the United States that tastes exactly like that, the tastes of Maine. And I think that's important. And yeah. I don't think that was really possible when I was a kid. 
there was no zoo bakery. There weren't a kind of a plethora of options for excellent eggs. Um, there sure was venison, um, but not the other two. And now there is, and that's that's really neat. So I like to kind of evangelize about the, the, the food scene in Maine to people who think that they're just gonna get, you know, a lobster roll and some B&M beans. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, as everybody on this call is aware. Yeah, when, when I've talked to people about Portland in particular, I think people are, are surprised that the, the food scene is as kind of as sophisticated as it is. Uh, and some of that has to do with the, the people that are here and some of that has to do with the, the produce and the, the meat and the fish that come from right around here. So I, I, I didn't talk to you about this before, but if you had to make a guess about why Portland has kind of become a food destination and it hasn't happened to similar sized cities, places like, um, I don't know, Pensacola, Florida, that kind of place. Uh, what would you say? What's, what's your best guess about why that happened here? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I think it has to do, like all New York Times editors, I'm going to bring it back to New York City. <laughs> like I always do. <laughs> but one of the interesting things that happened in the New York restaurant world was that there was a flowering 15 years ago, 20 years ago, of restaurants in Brooklyn. And these restaurants helped lead the Manhattan into a kind of new high watermark for uh, quality restaurants. Why? Because the rents were cheaper in Brooklyn and people could take chances. Um, there was a time when I thought Boston was doing, doing that. And then when Portland was doing that. Now, the rent thing is a little tricky because rents are, are are tricky in Portland as they are in, in all cities and particularly now coming, coming out of the coronavirus. And there's also the complicated business of like deep, deep winter of that kind of February lull, uh, late January, February, March. If you can make it over that, you can, you can succeed. Right, but the right. people who came to open shops, restaurants in, in Portland did so, the ones who succeeded did so with open eyes um, and took advantage of the ability to get the space, the quality of the ingredients that are all around um, the city and their own creativity to bring something, you know, the, um, just, you know, the Sondheim lyric about there's a hat where there never was a hat. There's a cocktail Mary where there was never a cocktail Mary. Like right. that, you know, that's that willing a cocktail bar like that into existence is that's pretty cool. And I think a testament to a, a city's food culture that wants to um, continue and flourish. Absolutely. When my editor and I have been talking about this, uh, we, we've kind of come up with this idea that, that Maine and Portland in particular has always been involved in the production of food and the, the shipping of food elsewhere to the rest of the country. So it's always had this natural connection to the food world. And that's maybe why it didn't happen to Pensacola or, you know, Eureka, California, that sort of thing. Even though those are port cities, they're not food destinations the way Portland has become. Right. They were never shipping out tons and tons of seafood and moving tons and tons of potatoes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when you're in Portland uh, and when you're in Maine in general, what are some of the, the, the places that you like to go? Uh, restaurants or bakeries or coffee shops? What are your favorites? Well, to tell you the truth, uh, what I like to do is go to the farmer's market. And I usually go to the farmer's market in Harpswell uh, or, and in Bath. Um, although I love the one in Belfast as well. And if I can kind of work it out so that I can get to those, I'm, I'm happy. Because I'm really... It's really neat to be able to have access to those fruits and vegetables, that lamb, those cheeses in a way that is unmediated by um, uh, a restaurant experience. I'm all for like, sure, let's go to Portland. Let's go to Cocktail Mary for a cocktail. Sure. I'd love to go to 4th Street and like just soak it all up. But when I'm in Maine, I want to cook. I want to I want to make no recipe recipes as the title of my uh, new book would have it, 
and I hope everybody will take a look at No Recipe Recipes. Um, and I wanna use these amazing ingredients, which I'm gonna be frank with you, are better in many cases than what I can get in New York and uh, treat them as, as respectfully and deliciously as possible and get a good meal out of them. That's what I wanna do. So let's talk about that. Let's, let's talk about No Recipe Recipes. Uh, Obviously, it must have been in the works before the pandemic, uh, and it just happens to have come out during a, a time when I think a lot of people are probably getting a lot of fantastic use out of it and out of the very idea behind it. So talk a little bit, if you could, about the idea of flexibility that, that underlies the concept of the book and improvisation uh, and maybe how that's even more important now than ever. Absolutely. I, I would love to. I had the great misfortune last year of um, publishing a, what I think is a pretty good cookbook called See You on Sunday, a cookbook for family and friends that celebrated the idea of welcoming people into your home, um, welcoming strangers into your home. That came out on February 25th, and we were in lockdown oh, gosh. a couple of <laughs> weeks later. That was going to be the subject of our discussion at Maine Voices Live last year. The pandemic um, uh, messed that up. But luckily, in my back pocket, um, New York Times cooking, no recipe recipes. And this time, I think we got the timing right a little bit because people are cooking so much more than they have sometimes for some of them ever in their lives. And I'm hoping that this cookbook, cookbook um, will be of service to them. As a reporter, I spent a lot of time in kitchens talking to chefs about how particular dishes of theirs are made. Sometimes they give me recipes. I'm here to tell you cooks, chefs are generally, there are exceptions, are generally pretty terrible recipe writers because they, they are writing what they think is helpful to the home cook when really they're professional chefs who are using their own kind of shorthand, their own kind of terminology. Uh, and also cooking sometimes much larger um, yields than we need in the home kitchen. So I tell them, stop, stop, don't give me the recipe. Just tell me how to make the dish. And when they do so, they don't use precise ingredients. They don't tell me the temperature. They don't tell me, you know, high heat, low heat. They say, saute it, saute it hard, add some salt you know, whatever. It's, it's not specific, but it tells me enough that I can go home and try and make the dish. Mm -hmm. And it's so exciting when I do, because it's now my dish. I've made it according to a prompt, but I haven't made it according to a precise recipe. A precise recipe means that it's like sheet music. If I follow the steps exactly as written and, you know, play it, exactly as written, I'm going to have a passable uh, version of the song the artist wrote. The, the food is going to taste kind of like what the guy intended. When I cook a no recipe recipe, I can take it in any direction I want. It's like I've been given four chords and a sense of what the, you know, what the chorus sounds like. And I can make a, a, a recipe that is inspired by the prompt but is entirely my own. And it requires a little bit of self-confidence to do, but I think we all now at the, whatever we're in, season four of pandemic, um, I think we've got that confidence. Um, and I think that once you do a couple no recipe recipes, your self-confidence increases once again. And, uh, you know, an incredible freedom in the kitchen is put forth. It's, it's, it's pretty fun. You know, I was talking to someone who is not a natural home cook, and we were talking about your book, and she was saying that she was a little nervous about doing it, and she's a big fan of the Great British Baking Show, or Great British Bake Off, depending on where you're from. And I was saying, well, this book is a lot like the technical challenges that come in the middle of that show, because they get kind of a very sketchy skeleton version of the recipe, and most of the time, the people generally know how to do things like make shoe buns or you know make a shaboost that kind of thing and then they go out and they do it and what you see by and large 
looks kind of like what you expect, but they're all slightly different with their own twists and, you know, amplified flavors of certain sorts and, you know, maybe a little bit tangier here and a little bit saltier there. Uh, but it's really kind of wonderful to have this looser set of directions and go in your own direction with it. Yeah, it's jazz, man. It's <laughs> improv. You can do it as you like. I don't recommend uh, Great British Bake Off notwithstanding. I don't really recommend no recipe recipes for pastry or for baked goods. I think sure. you can go off the rails pretty quickly there. <laughs> but but for for pastas, for for chilies, for for um, burgers, for tacos, for pizzas, for salads, you know, it's just about taking like a couple ingredients that you wouldn't ordinarily think could go together and like trust me it works yeah. i've got a, a like you know a peanut butter sandwich with pickles and sriracha people f you know look at me crazy like i'm crazy for suggesting they make that <laughs> and then they make it and eat it and they think okay I, I i can i can build on this yeah so what are some of your favorite no recipe recipes that you've come up with and why are those your favorites well Listen, you're putting me on the spot here. There are like <laughs> I know you've got a whole book of them. There are a hundred, I have a hundred children and you're asking me to pick <laughs> just one or two to, to tell you about. I think one of the joys of this book to me is that it, it, it these recipes came about and they continue to happen um, as, a, as a part of my process for writing the newsletter for New York Times Cooking. It's a newsletter that goes out four times a week. And in the middle of the week, when I reckon that people are, are, are tired of following recipes, I offer a no recipe recipe. And it usually comes about um, as the result of my cooking the previous week when I'm trying to develop the next week's no recipe recipe. So a lot of these things don't become um, regulars in my rotation because I'm constantly having to, to, to come up with new ones. Mm -hmm. And so what was so great about, and I'm looking at the book right now uh, off to my side, um, what was so great about having the book come out is I was able to revisit lots and lots of, of, of old favorites, like things that, I, that really should be in my regular rotation if, if I, if I could. And there are, you know, I've got great stuff with rotisserie chickens in here. If you don't want to shop easy chicken teriyaki's meatball salad, miso glazed scallops. Oh, look at these things. They're great. Salt and pepper shrimp. I made that with squid the other night and it was great, which is a perfect example of no recipe cooking. Yeah. You know, make it with a different protein if you want. Um, these pastas are bonkers. I, I look, it, look, you got it. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk a little bit about food journalism in general, and maybe let's shift back to the New York times a bit. So can you talk a little bit about how food journalism at the New York times has changed recently? And what are some of the lessons that other outlets, traditional and both new media outlets can take away from what's going on at the times? Well, there's some really exciting things that are happening uh, at the New York Times, and they're happening because, um, because of and thanks to um, our subscribers who, um, uh, who have made us a, a success um, and who have provided us with uh, the ability to expand our staff. One of the difficulties that food journalism in general has is it's a great gig. There's not a lot of turnover. People come in, they stay for a long time. Florence Fabricant um, has been writing for the New York Times um, since I was in preschool. Uh, so yeah. it's, it, you know, it, the only way often to grow um, is to grow, is to be a, a financial success. And we've been a financial success and we've been able to add new voices to our team in the past year. And it's really exciting. We, we hired Priya Krishna. We hired Yuande Komalafe. We hired Eric Kim. We hired Nikita Richardson. These are, these are solid, young, excellent journalists who are coming to us um, to uh, spread their wings and fly and, 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 and help us tell the story of food um, to the nation. And 
you know, I'm just thrilled that we we're able to do that. Um, the, the, the issues that food journalism has faced over the past, let's say, year or, or more, which, which go to like, who gets to tell stories? Who's the gatekeeper? Um, how are the stories told? Who's in the room? Those are really important questions and ones that we are addressing and, and luckily have the wherewithal to address. Uh, on our staff, but it's not just about staffing. It's also about uh, expanding our notion of where the stories are and how we're telling the stories. I think there was a long period of time at the times when, you know, Johnny Apple, the great Johnny Apple would just parachute into places around the world and then tell a story as uh, uh, like an old school foreign correspondent. And, you know, what we're able to do now is uh, really embed people in places to learn those places and, um, and then allow them to, to tell their stories back to our readers. As an example of that, um, Tejal Rao, uh, your fellow restaurant critic, is working not in New York, but in Los, she lives in Los Angeles and covers the state from there. And that's really important because um, it means that the Times isn't discovering stuff in California, it's reporting on stuff in, in California from um, an empathetic Californian point of view, not as an right. outsider. So speaking of, of new voices and that sort of thing, uh, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about uh, the, the changes to, to Maine and to food writing at the New York Times, but let's talk a little bit about the way things are moving going forward, um, especially with an increased awareness of, of issues around sustainability and waste and climate change, that sort of thing. So how is the food writing at the Times and maybe in your own writing, how, how are you taking that into account? And how do you think we can do a better job of factoring those into our decisions as consumers or, or diners? Um, well, I think as journalists, we have to proceed from a position of radical empathy for what is happening in our world and what is happening to our food and what is happening to our uh, the food chain it, it itself. Um, there are those who would have us turn around and, and, and say, do as we did uh, in, in 2020, write articles about like, here's a way of thinking about your relationship to food if you wanna factor in uh, global warming. These are the sort of actions that you can take to mitigate your own contribution to global warming from, from the kitchen. Uh, and obviously that is gonna mean, or should I say, obviously that is gonna mean that you're gonna consume less red meat than, than and more grains, maybe, but maybe you live in the state of Maine and there's a, a small sustainable farm that's producing the greatest lamb in the world and you can eat that sometimes too. And, and that's important. I don't wanna take a, a, a stance so much as I want us to report out where people are, where the planet is going, and what you can do should you want to take part in mitigating that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I don't think that's as simple as saying like we're going to run more plant-based foods, although we are going to run more plant-based foods um, in. in um, on the site and in the section, but I think it's it's part of it. I think having the conversation, doing the reporting that suggests here's where we are, here's where we're going, is important. And I don't want to I don't want to be a laggard on that. I think it's important to say, like, hey, it's kind of interesting in the state of Maine. It's kind of interesting that uh, agriculture is taking off, that these oyster farms are doing so well. And one reason why it's interesting is because it's, uh, it's indicative of, quite frankly, some warming waters. And so there's some kind of scary notions there of like, what happens as the lobster stock pushes up into Canadian waters? 
yep. um, that when that when that boom is over, because um, we've seen those rising stocks. Um, I think it's important to report on that. The Times did, it was before my time, but I think the Times didn't do a very good job on reporting on the rise and fall of sea urchin in the state of Maine. I don't want us to make that mistake again. It's probably really difficult also to to draw the line between what's an opinion piece or an editorial and what's reportage or, you know, what what's food writing in general. I think that that's a, it's an increasingly blurry line. And if you want to encourage people to eat in a more sustainable fashion, how do you do that in a way that doesn't really feel like you're preaching to them? That's yeah, I difficult. want there to be a nice, bright line between opinion and reportage, right? I think that, you know, the, the food journalism um, in too many places has become food journaling, where it's all about me and my opinion, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to uh, the, the answers to the questions that we raised um, with the subject of the, of the story. I think the answer or the cure to what ails us in the world of food media when it comes to issues of sustainability, issues of global warming, issues of equity and inclusion is reporting. It's not opinion. It's not preaching. It's going out and finding stories and telling them in an empathetic and clear way uh, that help people understand the world. So let's shift gears just a little bit. I want to ask you about some of the sensitive topics that food media has been dealing with recently. The Bon Appetit, Condé Nast issues uh, around representation, and then kind of a, a meta version of that through a Gimlet podcast called Reply All. And then the New York Times cooking Facebook group, which has had its, its own fascinating story, <laughs> at least from an external point of view, it's fascinating. It's probably not much fun to, to deal with it uh, as, as someone who's kind of shepherding it. But can you talk a little bit about how the paper has approached sensitive topics like these and the oh absolutely i'm happy to i i think that above all else i want the new york times to to show its work rather than than talk about it um i think that um i think i'm i think it's fair to say that i'm proud of the progress that we've made and i'm looking forward to showing everyone more progress as as we move forward um, that goes to issues of uh, who's in the room and who gets to tell stories and and who you know becomes a star or not even a star, just a, a solid citizen of the of the New York Times. Um, I'm fascinated by people's interest in the Facebook page and the New York Times cooking community uh, Facebook page, which we set up um, as a kind of experiment in community. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew we weren't going to beat Facebook on community, like, and yet increasingly, I started looking at two things. On the one hand, the notes that we encourage people, subscribers to leave below recipes on New York Times cooking. And on the other, the, the Facebook page itself. And the notes, perhaps because we called them notes and not comments, um, were, were and are a generally um, kind and supportive and empathetic place where people are saying, I used this much salt, or I thought this had too much butter, try it at a higher temperature, um, I love this recipe, et cetera. Um, and that worked out really well. Meanwhile, over in Facebook land, um, fights were breaking out uh, over politics. Right. Fights were breaking out over the moderation of political posts on, on Facebook. And I think it's safe to say we came to the conclusion that like at a certain point, does it make sense for a New York Times employee to spend a goodly part of her day moderating comments for Mark Zuckerberg's platform? And I think the answer to that is, is, is no. Um, Facebook groups are really interesting places. We put out a call to say, hey, do any of you guys wanna run this site? They, we got dozens of people who said, yeah, we'd love to run this site. And we just said, great, and handed it over, handed over the keys and, and backed away. There wasn't like when you looked at it, it's a pretty cool place. Um, a lot of interesting conversations going on there. But it wasn't precisely like driving people back into the world of, of New York Times cooking. And 
again, I feel weird enough about living in Facebook landia um, that it seemed okay to say, hey, employee of the New York Times, let's work on New York Times stuff yeah. and let people on Facebook worry about stuff on Facebook. Sure. So speaking of, of doing things. Uh-oh. We got a hang up here. Is that just happening for me, MJ? Uh, no, I'm seeing him frozen also. Wow. This is, this is, this is the rapture. This is what happens when I'm going to go to the Q and a and find a question. And Mike O'Neill needs a pep talk. Frozen chicken cordon blue subscribes to New York times, reads the column, never makes anything feels intimidated. Let me tell you, you just got to make something, find something really simple and easy to make. You could, you could get going with, um, you know how to boil water. I, if you can make a frozen chicken cordon bleu, you know how to boil water. So you boil water, put a lot of salt in the water, make it salty, like uh, Maine seawater. Um, that's so that you will flavor the pasta that you're going to cook in that beautiful, hot, salty water. You're going to cook it until it's just al dente. And then you're going to mix it with butter, Parmesan, and some red pepper flakes. And you're going to use a lot of butter and a lot of Parmesan. Like, like people look at you a little funny. There's so much in there. And you're going to discover that it's really delicious. And once you've had that success, you're going to be able to turn the page and find another recipe that looks a little bit more complicated than the butter and Parmesan version that I just gave you. And you're going to make that. And if you can put together four or five of those meals in a row, you're never going to go back to eating frozen chicken cordon bleu on a Tuesday in April. Welcome back, sir. <laughs> Sorry about that. We continue to have issues with the internet after the big outage uh, of a couple of days ago. So I apologize for that. Uh, I heard the end of your, your answer. Uh, and I wanted to ask a question that that one of our uh, participants asked, and I thought it was a really great question. So this is from Amy Sinclair at Fork Food Lab. And she was asking about what you think about the role that food incubators play in America's cities, especially ones that are sort of on their way up or uh, growing into food destinations. I'm, I'm always suspicious of investors <laughs> myself. Um, I'm not a business person and couldn't ever be a business person, um, probably because I'm, you know, um, I've got issues with authority like many uh, journalists. Um, but I think that that said, food incubators have done a lot of good to bring some interesting entrepreneurial ideas a little bit more into focus for cities and allow um, smaller market um uh, towns to, to, or cities and towns um, to bring a food scene to life a little more quickly than they might have otherwise. And I'm trying to think of an example, and I'd probably use Louisville, Kentucky, um, um, because it, I, I, I think they did some, work, work, some um, incubator work there uh, that led to some positive outcomes. And I think I've seen that in Omaha as well. In Nebraska, which is surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, is a good food city. Great, thank you. So we've got a whole bunch of questions and there's, there's one, one that stuck out to me uh, and it was about, where was it now? I've lost it again. Um, so it was about fishing and ah. it was from Mary Poles. And uh, she was asking if you could tell us about your fishing life in Maine and New York. Oh, sure. So I'm a pretty passionate fisherman. Um, I'm, um, I'm also a little bit of a ridiculous person. So I do a lot of saltwater fly fishing. It's the least effective way of targeting the species I'm interested in. And I spend a lot of time saltwater fly fishing uh, for striped bass. And I do that here in New York, and I do it in the state of Maine as well. Um, it's most exciting to me on um, on the flats, uh, on the on, on the sort of shallow water uh, spots where you can see the fish um, coming, 
um, if you're very quiet and in the right position on the right tide. Here in New York, we have the glory of being able to, to fish over some um, white sand bottom where, where it's like you might as well be in the Caribbean. You're seeing these beautiful animals come up um, and approach and hopefully eat a fly of your own making. And that's great. In Maine, a little different, a lot of mud flat fishing. That's super challenging um, and, and really exciting. Uh, that said, haven't killed a striped bass in over 10 years, I don't think. Um, I think the stocks are in real trouble. Um, and I think they are worth more in the water than they are on, on the plate, um, which doesn't make me not a meat fisherman. Um, I, um, I grew up um, fishing for cod and pollock um, uh, with my father and, and um, with my brothers. Um, and though you got to go a little bit further offshore now to, to get them, um, we continue to do that. Um, uh, I love a mackerel run um, and um, getting a lot of Saba for, for Maine yeah. State Sushi is, is just a great, great joy. And then here in the, in the New York region, um, we get shots for meat again at um, black sea bass mm -hmm. and orgy. What's interesting is um, those black sea bass are, are moving down east. And that's, that's, that's wild to me. Um, and I think, you know, if they come in big numbers, I wonder whether that, what that's going to do to the remaining lobster or if the lobster are going to get out of dodge before they show up, but they like eating crustaceans um, and yeah. I'm sure would feast on, on baby lobster. And then above and beyond everything else, it would be, I, I don't think that, I don't think anybody should be buying or selling bluefin tuna, but boy, it's delicious to eat. And if you can catch one yourself, I think you get to keep it. <laughs> uh, I want to circle back to something you said about mackerel. I, it's such an underappreciated fish, I think, because it's a little bit, uh, a little bit odiferous. I think people <laughs> shy away from it. It's like bluefish, which, you know, is a, a great fish, but a friend of mine describes it as smelling like the bottom of an aquarium and he's not wrong, but it's also really delicious. It's super delicious. I mean, I grew up eating, you know, fillets of mackerel, you know, sauteed in, in butter, you know, and for breakfast with my dad. So um, I, I, I'm aware of how stinky it sometimes can be. <laughs> but I think, you know, like bluefish, it gets a bad rap. If you bleed them right away, keep them iced and, and, um, and get them into the pan right away. That's a delicious fish. And Absolutely. I eat it, you know, I'll eat it raw for, for sushi, as I say. So tell us a little bit about what you think about sous vide. Karen Lamb has a question about sous vide and whether you believe it's worth investing in. Um, I, I think at this point, no. And particularly uh, for in this uh, gathering, the food's too good in the state of Maine. We don't need, we don't need it. Um, I do believe sous vide has a value and there's something exciting about being able to, um, you know, cook a steak to a perfect temperature that allows you to sear it off. And then you've, you know, it's no worries whatsoever. I like the fact that I could put, um, chicken in a sous vide bag and then use it so precisely that when I fry it, I end up with the greatest fried chicken in the world, mm -hmm. even though it's just garbage commodity chicken from, from the supermarket. But at the end of the day, it's like, it's a little bit of a magic trick. Like mm -hmm. it's not going to be better than spending the extra dough to buy the amazing chicken at the farmer's market or the amazing lamb at the, at the farmer's market. Um, it, it is a good way of, I mean, look, if you cook a lot of steaks and you don't want to screw them up, sous vide is your man. But I don't think there are a lot of people who cook that many steaks. I guess sous vide is pretty good for eggs, though. Um, I, but I'll, I can speak only from experience. I have a sous vide, circu uh, an immersion circulator, and I use it like twice a year. And I cook, I have cooked every night for a year and a half. And right. whatever, use the sous vide machine twice. So take your answer from that. <laughs> I like to use mine, but generally what I'll do is I'll, especially on a night when I've got a deadline the next day, I, I get everything all set up and I start the rice cooker in the afternoon. I start the sous vide machine in the afternoon. And then when I'm 
good and ready and everything is turned in, then I'll walk into the kitchen and then just take things out and you know, sear whatever it is I put in the sous vide machine. But uh, Wow, that sounds like a pretty good plan, Andrew. I like that. Maybe it works all right. Plan. Yeah, <laughs> it works all right. So uh, Kathy Pritchard has a really good question. Are there any foods you won't eat? Well, I think, I mean, listen, I think in this game, it's pretty wise to be open to eating anything that is put in front of you. And, you know, I've been asked that question a lot over the years. And for, for a while, after a really unfortunate experience with a very large cow brain that I ate in St. Louis, I was like, you know, I don't really need the brain. Um, but, you know, brain's really delicious. I just had this terrible brain in a diner in St. Louis, um, where, yeah, where, where, I mean, it was like half a basketball with a thing of chips next to it. And it, it was just disgusting, but you know, brain is delicious. It's, it's like scrambled eggs. If it's, if it's prepared correctly and, and isn't, you know, wasn't frozen 30 seconds before it was deep fried as I think this thing in St. Louis was. So yeah, there are no foods that I, just say hard pass. That's probably a good policy, especially when you were uh, a restaurant critic. That that's, uh, I think, a, a smart move. Oh, absolutely. In fact, one of the things that I think is interesting about um, restaurants, menus, and restaurant critics is that I, I don't know if you feel this way, Andrew, but I I can always spot on the menu of a of a new restaurant what the critic bait is. <laughs> You know, there's, yeah. because you know, there's going to be a tomahawk steak on there. That's the like banker bait, the, the whale bait that where you know, somebody is willing to spend $200 on the steak. He's probably a rich guy, probably a guy and probably wealthy, yep. but somewhere on there is going to be some piece of offal or something involving a foot or a brain or an ear, a cheek, a lip. Um, and that's there for the critic who's overjoyed to see it because now he doesn't have to review the, that night, doesn't have to review the salmon or the chicken. Right. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Uh, and sometimes I, I will purposefully avoid those dishes just for that very reason. And then, yeah. you know, go for the other stuff. Uh, so this connects up to something that we were just talking about. But one thing that that when I've talked to people about about writing about restaurants, they they've said, "Oh well, you need to you need to do the thing that the restaurant wants you to do when you order from the menu," and I see what they're saying. At the same time, one of the things that that I've always said is, if you put something on your menu, you should expect that people will order it. Not everybody; it might not even be that many people. But if you put something on your menu, it should be good enough so that it should pass muster, no matter who orders it. Uh, and that doesn't mean that I'm going to order a, a steak every time I go to a, a, a lobster restaurant or, you know, the fried chicken at a, a pizza place. But um, what, what's your take on that, about ordering something that doesn't feel like it fits in with the main theme, but is a part of the, the menu or an important it's part? On, it's on the menu. It's fair game. I want to know why it's there. You know, yeah. if someone puts a steak on the, on, on the menu, it's because they want to sell, they've got, they want to use that food cost to make some money. Um, uh, if someone puts fried chicken on the menu at the pizza place, I want to know why. Yeah. You know, and so I'm going to, and the best way to figure out why is to order it because maybe it's outstanding or maybe it's just terrible, but everybody's got fried chicken on the menu. And then that's a data point that you're going to use in your reviews. You kind of examine how cynical the owners are right? <laughs> or, or how, um, how optimistic they are about their creativity. Either way, if it's there, I want to eat it. Yeah. Let me ask you a, a version of a question that Kathleen uh, Tubman asks. She asks a question about making substitutions to recipes, published recipes. And at some level, I feel like the no recipe recipe thing inoculates you against that. You publish a no recipe recipe and people can do whatever the heck they want to with it. And you'll read the comments and you'll find all the great variations of it that you didn't anticipate. And that sounds like a great thing. And I know that sometimes for cookbook writers, they will publish a recipe and then they'll just be completely mortified that someone decided that they can substitute you know, a half gallon of Greek yogurt for skim milk or something like that. Yeah, I mean, all the time. I mean, you know, the classic one is like, 
you know, I, I didn't have chicken thighs, so I made it with anchovies and it's <laughs> disgusting. Um, I, I, I see that all the time and I, and I think it's kind of funny. Um, of course, you can make a recipe however you want. Um, and the whole point of my No Recipe Recipes cookbook is that you ought to do that. But you shouldn't hold us to account if you follow an, a, a written recipe uh, off the trail and use a completely different flavor and not like it. That's, uh, that's, yeah. always, that's always funny to me. But, you know, what's great about the notes on the recipes in New York Times cooking is it's kind of a self-regulating community, a very supportive community. And people point that out. Like the reason you had that bad outcome is because you used full fat yogurt instead of the chicken stock the author uh, suggested you use. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we've got just enough time for a few more questions. Let me ask you a question from Jillian Britt who asks about current trends in food that you would like to see go away. I would like to see this trend where you can't eat in the restaurant, you have to eat on the sidewalk and you can only get takeout. I'd, I'd love to see that go away. I'd like to see us back in a world where we can crowd into a tiny dining room and have it be a little bit overcrowded and quite a bit loud and a little smoky and lots of tinkling um, from the uh, cutlery hitting the, the, the glasses and the smells of, of other people's dishes as the waiters bring them by and the servers bring them by. That's a trend I'd like to see come back. Mm -hmm. So where do you think things are going in terms of recovery from the pandemic? I, we've gotten a few questions that, that touch on that. So it seems like it's on, on obviously it's on everybody's mind in, in some way, shape or form, but uh, what's, your, what's your gut feeling? I know that it's impossible to make a really accurate prediction. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, I'm not much for prognostication, but it does seem to me that you know we're gonna come out of this. We're gonna be a largely vaccinated nation. We're gonna have overcome to some degree um, the the worries that we have about being close to other people. It'll be summertime. Um, restaurants that made it this far will likely flourish. I don't know if we're going to move hard into a roaring 20s of, you know, French kissing French strangers on the street and going off for, you know, tiny restaurants packed with people as I want them to be. Um, I, for myself, know it's going to be a fair amount of time before I'm feeling comfortable uh, inside um, with lots of other people. But the, the incredible gloom and doom that we were marketing in or marketing in our journalism at the beginning of the pandemic, the numbers that suggested that 70% of restaurants would go out of business and the like, um, doesn't seem to have played out. Lots and lots and lots of restaurants have died um, and it's terrible, but a lot have survived. And I think that there's a kind of strength of enterprise and character that comes out of that that suggests to me this is going to be a pretty fun scene when we're back in it um, when that is going to be if we can avoid avoid a fourth surge i don't know um, but i'm looking forward to seeing what it's like when we get there absolutely it's also remarkable how different the experience we've had up here in maine probably in new york as well to the experience of some of the people in states that have been much more open from the very beginning, places like Florida and Texas, where they've been going to restaurants and eating indoors frequently without masks since April of last year. So at, at some level, it feels like we've had this big gap in our experience and they have had just a, a change in tenor and quality to their experience. I think that's, I think that's totally true. I mean, Look, we live in a deeply divided nation and we're divided politically and we're divided culturally and we're divided over our response to the coronavirus pandemic. I was in the state of Florida um, at the beginning of March in 2020 and 
there I can assure you there was no coronavirus there. None. People just did not acknowledge this this looming threat. Um, and you know, I I have family in Florida and and, and talking to them uh, over the course of the pandemic about what they were seeing as people just did not acknowledge the difficulty that they were putting other people in, did not acknowledge the severity of, of, of the issue. Um, that's a big problem. And it's, it's not just Florida versus uh, you know, New York. It's not just Florida versus, versus Maine. It's, it's parts of Maine versus Maine. It's parts of New York versus New York. It, you know, Nassau County, in New York on the western end of Long Island, which was a huge COVID hotspot and still is a very dangerous place in terms of, um, in terms of uh, transmission. You, know, you drive to Nassau County, you'll see plenty of people who, who aren't masked up and, and don't wear masks. So this is why it's wise not to prognosticate about what's gonna happen in the next few months. Yeah, absolutely. So I just wrote an article about this, and I, I talked to a whole bunch of people who were somehow connected to food in the state of Maine, and I asked them all what they were looking forward to most once the pandemic is officially behind us. And I know that's not a hard and fast thing. You can't just you know, draw a line under it and say, all right, we're done. But for you, what is the thing that you are looking forward to doing, food-related, you know, at, at least, uh, once the pandemic is behind us. Well, this echoes something that, that I was saying before in a kind of jocular way about trends, but I really want to get back into restaurants. And when I say get back into restaurants, I don't mean, you know, elbowing up to the bar at Applebee's and getting an appetizer selection and a cold Budweiser, although that is awesome. And I'd like to do that too. What I would like to do is to go into a small, family-run restaurant, uh, or, or at least a small independent restaurant is how I should put it, um, that's committed to local ingredients, that's committed to excellence, and that's committed to kind of like hurting me with the quality and excellence of the, of, of the food. Mm -hmm. And I want to be right close to my friends and family, and I want to have that meal, and I want it to last a long time. And I want the candles to burn down. And I want to think, gosh, I'm glad we made it through this and we're on the other side. That's what I'm looking forward to. That sounds amazing. Also, continued sales of no recipe recipe. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Andrew. Well, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, MJ. We knew it was going to be a great conversation, Sam. We hope we can book you to come in person when we can all get together and have some good food and have the candles burned down. Um, what, what a great image you set for us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I was sorry to miss it for the pandemic last year. I'm so happy to do it this year, and I look forward to doing it live in person when we can do so. I'd like that very much. Thank you. Well, we know that you're in town, so we're yeah. definitely going to hold you. We're definitely going to hold you to that. So thank you. I Great. just wanted to, to take a moment um, to address all of you, our attendees tonight. And, and while we've spent the last hour talking about food, it's also a good opportunity to acknowledge that food is not a given for all Mainers. And so many of our neighbors have been experiencing hunger throughout the pandemic. No community in our state is unaffected. And the Good Shepherd Food Bank, Maine's largest hunger relief organization, has set a bold goal of ensuring every Mainer has access to enough nutritious food by the end of 2025. I hope you've heard about their campaign to end, end hunger. Strawberry, of course, who runs our Zoom uh, events, has popped a link in the chat where you can get information on how to support this campaign. We hope you'll consider it. I also wanted to remind you that we're hosting our annual Source Awards online this year on April 
1st at 7 o'clock, where we honor Maine sustainability leaders. We are so excited to have Joel Clement as our keynote speaker, and we also have some special live performances from some Maine musicians. It's going to be a really great night. Um, and finally, when you leave tonight, you're going to get a survey. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you thought about tonight, who else you'd like to see on Maine Voices Live, how you're feeling about the Press Herald these days. Thank you again, Sam, Andrew, and have a wonderful evening, everyone. And thank you for being part of the Press Herald community.